Now can you hear me? Pretty well, pretty well. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Sara Fakir. I will be the hosting of this conversation with uh, Tommy D. To me, D. Uh, you, you must correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but let me... Uh, so just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Sara Fakir. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur and co-founder of Idea Lab, an entrepreneurship support organization uh, founded in 2010 with the guiding purpose of inspiring entrepreneurs, supporting the development of startups uh, and the growth, acceleration and growth of SMEs uh, in Mozambique. But we are also operating in the region as well as in Angola through a partnership. Uh, I'm very happy to be here in this conversation. Um, I've been uh, along my journey, uh, I had the opportunity to meet uh, our keynote speaker uh, and hear from him a uh, few times uh, and for me it was also an inspiration uh, so just to to go directly we have very short uh, only 40 minutes for this conversation which is very very short uh, let me introduce him um, TD uh, a man which his personal mission is to help drive development uh, in Africa by supporting young entrepreneurs using innovation and technology uh, to create social impact and economic value. Chief Investment Office of uh, Green Tech, uh, Capital Partners, uh, President of the uh, African Business Angel Network, co-founder uh, of many other several uh, angels networks in Lagos and as well as regionals and uh, continental and, and bringing all this movement and bringing um, African investors to have a say uh, globally. Uh, welcome. Uh, and I don't want to, 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 to miss time in, in this conversation. So I'll straight directly uh, to my first question to you. Uh, and in order to frame this conversation, please tell us, what is innovation for you? Okay. Um, well, I thought I would... Um, yeah, that's it. I'd sort of um, pass through with a set of slides. And um, on, on innovation, it's, it's really simply something new. Um, but that carries a lot of weight. It's something new being done to solve a problem or create value to a significant number of people. I like to say common people because uh, the more people uh, that you have an impact on with your innovation, then the more meaningful the innovation is. And the reason we aspire for innovation is because we all want to have a better life. Um, the ultimate goal, listening to the previous speaker, uh, and I was quite enamored by her thought piece, uh, is to think of humans as a whole. And holistically means it's not just the physical, okay, but also the knowledge capital and of course the spiritual capital that we possess and sort of harnessing all of this to create, to, to bring to life things we can imagine in terms of creating value for people and solving problems. So it sort of centers around that. That to me is what innovation is. Thank you very much. Um, in your life experience, uh, you led several innovative initiatives, uh, speci especially uh, technology-based innovations, uh, and you had gained experience in many different markets. But in 2000, you decided to, to shift your focus to Africa. Uh, what was the potential that you were envisioned 20 years ago to invest uh, and bring all this energy of innovation to the continent? And do you still think that those premises are, are still valid? Well, um, the answer is yes. Uh, what I'd seen, and I'd like people to cast their mind back, a number of things happened sort of towards the turn of the century. 
Uh, the first was Nelson Mandela's release and becoming president, which was a seminal moment for the continent. And for us in Nigeria, it was the return of democracy uh, with President Obasanjo being voted in in 1999. So these, these were historic moments and we felt the need to contribute to the development of a new continent. Um, in terms of its relevance today, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, which started in January, actually holds the promise for all of us uh, in terms of a desired future that we ourselves can actually build. And that is why uh, my life's dedication is to finding those bright entrepreneurs that are using innovation to create a future uh, on the continent and making sure that I do the best I can to get them funded, okay, so that they can create the jobs and uh, the value that will give us the kind of continent we all hope and desire for. I like that you brought that uh, perspective of the African market. Uh, I, I really think that it is an opportunity for all of us um, starting seeing us not just small countries and only looking for our internal markets, but also bring those, this perspective of uh, a market of more than a billion people uh, that definitely will allow us to grow uh, uh, faster. Um, you have been uh, a catalyst uh, of the many different entrepreneurial ecosystems, uh, not only in Nigeria, uh, but uh, in the continent. Um, as president of APAN, uh, you have been motivating the emerging of uh, uh, different uh, investors' networks. And, and I believe that putting the seeds so that us as Africans could see ourselves as an investors as well. Uh, because in my perspective for many years, we were taught that the, the investment is coming from overseas, but you are trying to build this community uh, of African investors. Um, you are also a business angel uh, and as well um, chief executive, uh, chief investment um, oh, uh, officer at Green Tech. With, in whom are you are investing, uh, TD? Uh, who, who are these in African innovators? What are the solutions that they are bringing to the market? Oh, excellent question. If you look at the screen, um, let's start with something like Sproxil. Sproxil is pharmacovigilance. It's, it's a long-winded word, but it is using SMS, okay, um, to validate drugs. That's how it started. Now it's validating other things. But as you, as you and I know, we have a, you know, a counterfeiting challenge with drugs. And what this simple solution does is it helps consumers before they buy a drug, send an SMS and find out if it's genuine or fake because the SMS goes to the manufacturer. Or well, let's take Power Stove. Um, one of my favorites right now, what Power Stove is doing is they are manufacturing stoves, okay, for women who could otherwise, you know, normally use firewood. And they are using reusable, renewable pellets and therefore, therefore being carbon, okay, negative and creating, you know, a, a better future uh, for us uh, that way. Or, you know, someone like FlexiSaf. FlexiSaf provides school management software, okay, to schools in Northern Nigeria and now in Southern Nigeria. And it's got over a million children, okay, being managed by its software in terms of the schools uh, they are in. So those are the kind of um, founders. So uh, for um, FlexiSaf, it's Faiz Bashir. For Power Stove, it's okay. It's safe. For Sproxel, it's a Shifi Gogo. You've got Tommy Waladikom of Big Cabal Media. Um, the list goes on, Khalil. Uh, Halilu of Shap Shap. Um, uh, the, uh, those are the kind of founders I'm looking for because they're all building the future of the continent and I'm quite excited about it. So they are also bringing impact, uh, you know, whatever they do, they are also bringing an additional impact um, uh, for the society where they, they, they are doing their they business. 
That's correct. So, um, in a in an investor investor perspective, uh, why should uh, Africans and non-Africans uh, invest uh, in these uh, African startups? Why do why should they do this? Well, What's the opportunity. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to speak to the internationals. I want to speak to the Africans. Okay, here, here's here, here's the deal. Okay, we've got a choice. All right. Um, if we've done well enough to look outside, we'll understand that the world is being built by the next generation, and we have the privilege of having the largest population of those. So the reason I particularly picked angel investing is because it's a local sport, okay? It's not just about cash, venture capital, I'm not talking about right now, but what we do is a few of us, like in my case, is people I went to secondary school with 50 years ago. We find these young, bright founders, the ones that have opportunity, and we put money together. It's not a lot of money, $50,000, $100,000, $250 at most, to get them started. Why is that important? It's not the cash. It's the fact that they've got a big uncle or somebody they look up to who can guide them along the way as they go through. And that's the challenge to the locals. We're all, everybody's doing property. I don't know of any country on the continent where you don't have property magnets. So those are the guys I'm speaking to. If you've got tenants, you need to look at startups. Okay, let's make it that simple. If you've got disposable income enough to set aside, put a building and put tenants in it and collect rent, you're good to go, okay? You don't need to have all that kind of money, but I'm just setting a benchmark so that people understand Okay, you don't have to have millions of dollars to invest in the next generation. If you've got $5,000 a year to spare, you're good to go. I trust that helps. Oh, By great. the way, for your information, me, I'm a Lagos boy. Lagos is in Nigeria. You see those startups I'm talking about? Okay, one or two of them are in Abuja and other places in Nigeria, but homegrown where I can see them. Okay, where I can help them, where I can work my networks on their behalf, and I know what's happening locally within the context of their market. And that's where the value add comes as an angel investor. I hope that helps. Great. Uh, and as you were speaking, uh, uh, I also co-found uh, an angel network here in Mozambique, where I am. Uh, uh, and I really hope that some of my uh, colleagues from the Angel Network uh, are here also hearing what you were saying, because as being uh, close to them, knowing the, the context where they are operating, being able to, uh, to bring, I believe, you know, you have a lot of experience, you know, a lot of people, and you can bridge uh, this um, linkage with other people that also can help those entrepreneurs to make their business uh, to grow. So very, thank you very much for, for being uh, so uh, incisive uh, in what you were saying, because I think that that is exactly what everyone needs to, who has this spare money to, to, to invest to start looking um, at these opportunities because they, they don't need a lot of money in the beginning, but they need uh, all this, the smart support that we can give to them so that they can give the steps until they reach the time they don't, they don't need us anymore. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think that from the, those examples that, that you gave us, uh, it's, it's quite understandable um, why it's important, why innovation is important. It, it, it's important because it can transform our reality. It, it, it can not only create jobs or, or um, generate revenue, but in fact, it can transform the, 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 the way uh, Africans are living their lives. Um, 
And just before I go to the next question, I also want you to bring here the perspective of technology and, and why also technology is important in this process, uh, in your vision. Right, well, the thing is this, tech is driving the emergence of new vibrant industries. Um, we talk about unicorns now in Africa, because we have that privilege. Yes, there's, there's a company called Flutterwave. You might have heard of them. Okay, um, FinTech. There are others, but clean tech is emerging. Agritech is emerging with drones. All of these are being driven by virtual reality, augmented reality, uh, internet of things. Um, I'll come back to AI in a second, but the critical thing is cognification of objects is what technology is, is getting all about. And what we're seeing is that accelerating innovation is just changing the way our world is evolving. Why? Because with cheaper and more efficient technologies, we're seeing the kind of disruptive innovation, okay, that wasn't possible just 20 years ago. And, and I, I really want to drill down on some of those things in a second, but I will let you on, I, but make the point that software specifically, because we need to understand this, software is what is eating enterprise and you can see it. And guess what? With all due respect, we are heading software. I, I, I am in the industry is heading to a trillion dollar worldwide market. That's why it's important. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, so this is important. Uh, there are things being done. There are in fact uh, startups that are emerging uh, with the, its full potential, uh, but uh, I think that we are still uh, running very slow. So the process, it takes time. It looks like things uh, are not happening uh, at the pace we want things to happen or uh, different uh, ecosystem players are moving uh, in, uh, in, in different pace. So what can we do to, or what, or what can be done to accelerate this process? And that in fact, uh, uh, these uh, startups can, can grow and be as much for, uh, transformative as, uh, as they have the potential to be. Well, the first thing I'm going to tell you is this, human design is human design. That's like saying, how do I grow kids faster? An 18 year old is an 18 year old. It could be a taller one, a bigger one, a fatter one, a faster one, a smarter one, but it's still gonna be an 18 year old. So that's the reality first and foremost, we're dealing with is we're dealing with time. Um, and there's no getting out of that. What I wanted to share is some of the things that are happening, okay, that I call the art of the possible. So if you look at agriculture, for example, you can imagine producing food at scale at a fraction of today's prices, okay? Food that's personalized, are you, are you listening to me? Yes. Sir. Specifically to your genes. Oh, and by the way, based on the last time you went to the toilet, that's when the future of nutrition. Oh yes. Now, you don't believe me? Guess what? There's actually a home toilet that monitors today. So we're moving from traditional, you know, uh, curative medicine. We're moving to preventive health and proactive health because of technology. You know, when I'm in a situation from a selfie, they can tell if you're ill. Think about that. You scan everybody on this summit and you can say, hey, you got to see the doctor. Sounds scary, but it's real. Now, one I wanted to drive home is this. 
I don't know how many people are aware about the sequencing of the messenger RNA 1273, which is the coronavirus uh, sequence. From sequence to production of nearly a billion was under a year, never happened before. That's talking about the acceptability of the messenger RNA for vaccines. So why aren't we looking at it for malaria? It's killing enough Africans as it is. Now, just let this headline sink in. Now imagine being able to 3D print houses at scale for $1,000 a house. We're building infrastructure in space today using printing technology. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to think through and Malawi is looking at it. Now, power is the holy grail. With the kind of investment that's gone in by the United States and others into renewable, most people are unaware as to how fast, okay, renewable prices are dropping. Now imagine the promise of cheap unlimited energy. So let me sort of end with something that came out in the last one week where Google's DeepMind announced that they were going to release the structure of every protein known to science in open source. And people are wondering, okay, what's, what does that mean? Well, look, let me give you some of the implications. Just fast forward. You'd be in a situation where you can say, hey, computer, can you make me an enzyme that will eat the plastic and produce some compost for my garden? On demand. Oh, by the way, computer, you know what? Make me an organ that will give me an alcoholic buzz, but I won't have a hangover. That's where we're going. We're talking of even getting to a point where we just say, computer, make me a cup of tea, hot and or gray. So this is sort of the promise that I see when I talk about innovation in the context in which you're talking about it, because it's not limited, okay, to what I talked about earlier and what we're seeing in the here and now. When I talk about building a future, these are glimpses into the future I talk about. I trust that helps. I believe it helped. Um, but I know that uh, you have other things to share with us. Uh, from, from your experience, you have been seeing uh, a lot of different ecosystems doing this move. When I ask you, so what us as Africans we can do, uh, and while we were discussing yesterday, you also uh, show me some different models of how many different uh, people in different parts of the world are, are addressing um, uh, the innovation and how they are incorporating innovation in their economic development. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say about that? With which examples you want to, to share with us? Uh, well, the thing was, if you remember your question was, all right, you know, I hear this, has it been done successfully somewhere else? And we'd studied, okay, the software economy, because like I said, this is the emerging trillion dollar economy. And you need to understand it if you are going to participate in it. And they are tiered. Um, so you have tier one, tier two, and tier three, and of course, tier four software economies. And they are clearly differentiated because um, when you look at um, tier one economies, they're major software exporters. And I'll come back, you know, uh, and, uh, paint a picture of one or two of them in a second, but surprise, surprise, you know, it's the United States and all the usual suspects. China is fast moving from a tier two to a tier one. And then you've got Brazil and others, okay, who are considered tier three. Um, I'm not gonna bore you with the classification uh, criteria because like I said, what I wanted to do was actually extract uh, not the big tier one companies, but, tier one companies that 
we call the three eyes and have a reference point and to abstract sort of help the audience understand why, how these guys did what they did. Okay, in the case of India, it took 50 years. In the case of Israel, about the same time, but Ireland did it in 15. I, you know, I'll leave the writing and people can have access to it, but I wanted to very, very quickly draw on what the similarities are, okay, of this. And, and the first, which is very important, and I'll come to it um, in terms of, you were asking me how we go forward, is surplus, surplus qualified manpower. Okay, they've got, if, if you take 500 engineers from India today, they're not gonna miss them. Well, if you, you understand what I mean, the general scheme of things. Similarly, you do that in Ireland or in Israel, you know, they've got enough brain power to export. That's sort of the first thing all of them have. The second is science and tech as a platform. Is, is at the core, you know, um, we talk about STEM and all of that. These guys have built, you know, uh, uh, towards that, that quantum. Then R&D, okay, research and development is, is inbuilt. But one critical one that I actually had to do a double take and, and dig deeper is the fact that they have culturally, culturally relevant objectives. The state of Israel is about Israel, India is about India, and the Ireland is about the Irish. And they play, okay, to that. How do they play to it? They use diaspora significantly. The Israeli diaspora in the US, the Irish diaspora in the US and Canada, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that use, of, the, of these communities as reputational intermediaries, okay, was also a very, very strong point that helped to penetrate those markets that they are in. So that's why I wanted to abstract that this is, these are tier one, but everybody, oh yeah, that's Thailand, 50 years yet at that, you know, who else is doing this? So I thought, well, let me bring it home. And in terms of bringing it home, you look at what, is happening with the United Arab Emirates and in Rwanda, they are steadily moving up the chain. And how are they doing this in tier four? Well, first is they're importing talent, but with mandatory indeed indigent knowledge exchanges. So it's not come and stay, it's come exchange and go. It's a transitory period they recognize Third thing is they all have, they both have very strong visionary leadership in government that's driving their development. The cultural rally, they've caught on to that. So Rwanda's focus is Africa. It's not just Rwanda. Rwanda is speaking, is punching above its weight and speaking on behalf of the continent. The UAE is doing the same with Arabia and they're using it as innovation stimuli not as control sequences, which is historically what we've done. And these nationalistic fervors are being used to embrace international partnerships. So if you look at the big technology giants, read hardware, they're being courted because they know software is what we're gonna to bring to the party. So, I'll answer your question before you ask it. <laughs> you ask for a model, how do we get there? It's a long haul and it's one, as you have seen, that takes dedicated, focused leadership. But there's a structure, there's a method and it can be done. The first thing is investing in education. Not just formal, but both formal and informal education that develops the skills and the human capital assets that you're going to require to get a critical mass. Remember what I told you about the surplus engineers and the surplus people? That's the first stage we've got to get to. And to do that, you've got to deploy the infrastructure and the policies required. 
that's going to promote private sector participation. When you do that, you can create a skilled professionals pool. I have bad news for everybody listening. I was speaking to a friend just yesterday who should know. All right. His name is Dr. Armstrong Takang, and he claims that the total pool of software developers on the continent, not in Nigeria, and that's what shocked me, said on the continent is less than 100,000. So I challenge anybody listening to please provide me with incontrovertible proof of any other numbers. I'm on Twitter. You can see it there. Now, once you've got the skilled professionals, and that typically will take anywhere from five to 10 years, depending on where you start, it's then to start to look at how you absorb them into the technology workforce and institutions so that you can invest in the professional service firms required to deliver local software. And it's those local software products and services, you know, that's why I'm proud, you know, um, a shout out without any apologies to my man, Tani Barrow, who runs System Spec in Nigeria. Okay, System Spec is a software company in Nigeria and in multiple countries, it's in the fintech industry. You need to look them up. You'll understand what I mean because they've helped things like help the Nigerian government save a hundred billion by putting in biometrics as an example. Now, once you've got these viable businesses, you're ready to move. But that's going to take another five to 10 years. Because building startups, which is where we are now, which we started about 10 years ago. Now we're starting to see the exits and everybody's sort of taking notice. We're still at the very beginning. Okay. There are less than 100 angel networks on the continent. So we're starting, but we're not there yet. We're not even close. But once you get the viable businesses, then you can start to think about how you build an industry around that. That's the stage when we talk about enabling environment for export. And that's, if you remember how India did it, then they got ready. And when they were ready, about 10 years ago, was it? Then it, all bets off, let's go. So the, it's a three-step move that I commend. And um, yeah. It's been tried, it's been tested, it's been done by Ireland, it's been done by Israel, it's been done by India, UAE is on its way, uh, Rwanda is following the same pattern, so I commend it to anybody who wants to go and I hope you find it useful. Thanks for listening. And definitely we have here a transformation framework that we can use now um, and, and I believe that uh, in our audience, uh, which are probably mostly uh, Angolans, but probably not only Angolans, uh, other African also hearing us today. Um, we have here a framework that can allow us to understand exactly what steps we should do. Uh, and, and I really like the way you put the things, like the, the attracting the talent and, and the diaspora. One of the things that I miss is that in Mozambique, we don't have a big diaspora. But it's not the case of Angola. So how to, to take advantage of that or having people uh, living abroad with different experience, with different knowledge, um, study in the, in the best schools around the world. How can we attract them and uh, bring them in uh, to, 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 to push uh, uh, and to start to consolidate, consolidate these ideas uh, or, 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 or this... Um, emerging products that make, sell, uh, make sense in the context where they are. Mm -hmm. And in looking at the context, and I like the example that you gave from Rwanda, that it's not about their country. We are in the region. The, 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 the difficulties that the exist and the, the challenges that are existing in Rwanda most probably are the same challenges uh, around in the countries around and in the continent. So, there is all, always the opportunity to, to, to look for these markets and, uh, and engage uh, with them. Uh, and obviously bringing science as well as research uh, and development uh, and making it as core 
uh, on the on the um, on a strong le leadership uh, can definitely uh, bring um, the 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 can bring you know the environment we need to push those things forward. Um, uh, before we leave, because we only have uh, three minutes now, I would like to know if there are any questions from the audience. Uh, if there is any questions, I would ask um, Jose or someone to, to put us here in the chat so that we can, um, so that I can read and, and share with you. But uh, uh, I don't know, let me see directly in the platform if I can see uh, something, questions in this panel. No, I can't see it. But well, you already gave us uh, your details, you are on Twitter. So please go and tweet uh, whichever questions you have to TD. Um, and obviously, let's keep building this momentum uh, uh, and, and uh, make sure that uh, we are not disconnected uh, uh, as people trying to enabling this uh, or bringing this enabling environment for the startups. Uh, and for the entrepreneurs who are hearing us, uh, you are also part of this discussion. So. Uh, don't uh, we know that the journey is difficult uh, we don't have you know all the the environments that you can see uh, in in big uh, hubs uh, where everything looks like it works very well the investors are there the big ideas are there but we also have opportunities uh, and we need to to pick them and and follow our our opportunities Thank you very much, uh, TD, for, for this conversation and, and for everybody who are listening to us, uh, don't uh, hesitate to go and, and provoke uh, and, and, and learn from, from TD in the social media and Twitter. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Uh, thank um, you, yeah. uh, Angola Innovation Summit, for inviting us. Your last word? Uh, well, I was just going to say exactly that. I'd like to thank the audience. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. I hope uh, you found some of my thinking provocative because that was the intention. Um, I hope you've also found uh, some of it useful and informative because that was also uh, the intention. Um, it is always my pleasure to answer any questions. Um, I am quite active on Twitter and um, please, through the organizers, send any emails uh, you might want. On that note, I thank you very, very much. My name is Tommy Davis. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. See you probably next year.